Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, Sean Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor. And of course, today's subject is history. And of course, the history involves general managers. Of course, it's a popular topic, particularly this week with John Snyder getting a five-year extension. He's now the highest paid uh, general manager in the National Football League. But uh, we'll talk to Ron Wolf about you know being a general manager. He's the Pro Football Hall of Fame general manager, went in as a contributor uh, last year and really has set up the league with so many great guys. I mean, for example, there's five top general managers that all learned from Ron Wolf. And Wolf, of course, worked in Oakland. He worked in Tampa Bay. He worked in Green Bay. Of course, he was the guy who traded for Brett Favre. He was the guy who signed Reggie White in free agency. He's the one who hired Mike Holmgren. You know, a general manager's job is always tough because, you know, first you're working behind the scenes. You are trying to, uh, you know, build some things in a very difficult task. And you have to always wait by your phone for what disasters are going to happen. A player arrested, you know, contract problems. You know, there's, you, you almost, when you hear that phone you ring, you go, "Uh uh-oh, what is this now? But when you have the great ones, you know, they're the ones that take it to a different level. And what's great about the guys like the John Snyders, you have to be creative. And, you know, what's interesting with John, you know, he's a guy, and, you know, sometimes you get the fortune of starting young. I mean, you go back into the early 1990s. I mean, he was working as the quasi-general manager of the Redskins, and he was back there with Marty Schottenheimer uh, and, you know, different times with the Redskins. He goes back a long way and a lot of his success is first learning some things from Ron Wolf then you start to work with coaches you know coaches like a Marty Schottenheimer uh, and so they you grow and you still have to be creative and so what's amazing is you think about a guy like John Snyder he's 45 years old he's been around for decades you know starting in his 20s and developing and you know getting teams ready and uh, you can see that uh, he's so good at what he does but what he's so good at doing is you know putting his ego aside Working with the coach that he's been around, whether it's going to be you know Mike Holmgren, whether it's going to be John's, uh, whether it's going to be Pete Carroll, Marty Schottenheimer, all the p- people that he's worked with, and then just try to get the players that he wants and then develop. And of course, you know you have different systems. You know, it's one where you have to make sure that you develop your own good team of scouts and then try to be creative on it. And you look at John Snyder. I mean, he is so creative. I mean, he's he knows what Pete Carroll wants. Long, angular cornerbacks. You know, he wants, you know, different type of offensive linemen for Tom Cable. He fits that and then goes, gets that and then has to go through the process of, you know, working it out. And then after that success, if you get the right player, then the next challenge is get that guy to a second contract. And this is so much tougher than it was before 2011 because, you know, literally uh, second contracts for draft choices, you may only have 40 or 50 in a year. And think about those numbers. This is league wide. You know, there's 32 teams. And so the average is maybe you can get one or two guys to second contracts. Well, John Snyder's been able to get, you know, as many as three and maybe as four. And that means that now you have a player for eight years and you're building it and you have a core group and you have to make sure that one, the players get along, and that's certainly been the case with what Pete Carroll is able to do uh, with the players. And, you know, they all fit, and uh, Snyder's been able to do that. And the weird part, and this is something I know I had to study, and I kind of shake my head. It's like the general managers don't get rewarded as well as they should. You look at the you know head coaches. I mean, Pete Carroll, my guess is, made about $11 million a year, and it's deserving. I mean, Bill Belichick's probably making 12 or $13 million a year, and Pete Carroll's right up with him as one of the best coaches in the National Football League. So that took care of itself. But then you look at general managers. Well, it took you know a long period of time for John Snyder just to top the $3.75 million a year that Ozzie Newsom was making with the Baltimore Ravens. And so that's less than a kicker, less than Justin Tucker, uh, who just signed, by the way, Ozzie Newsom signed up to a four year $16.8 million contract. Yet, you know, you're running one, a budget because, you know, team budget is going to be, you know, 150, 160 million dollars. If you hit on a low price pay- player, you're saving millions of dollars. And here you are, you know, kind of banging around to make as little money as a, a kicker is making. So, different field and you know what you're seeing in the national football league now is that uh, a lot of young general managers are getting a chance and uh you know if they don't work with their coach things go well go go to cleveland browns they had a bright coach ray farmer i mean right coach and mike Pettin, 
and a very bright general manager in Ray Farmer. I mean, Ray Farmer went to Duke. I mean, he was working in the Kansas City Chiefs. Very intelligent. One of the most intelligent guys in the league. And, uh, you know, he goes in there. And naturally, you're an employee, even though you're running the football operations, but you have to try to appease people. So what's the first thing he does? You know, he wants to appease the coach because he wants a cornerback who can shut down. And he thought they were going to get that in Justin Gilbert. All right, so they make that move in the first round. Then they know the owner, Jim Haslam, wants a quarterback, and he wants Johnny Manziel. So he maneuvers, makes a trade, and he gets Johnny Manziel. Well, Gilbert was terrible. I mean, you know, it didn't seem to work as hard. He didn't seem, I mean, he never has really materialized as a starting cornerback. And you know the problems with Johnny Manziel. And what ends up happening, after a couple of years, you lose your job. Then all of a sudden, the relationship with the coach starts to fall off. You know, in the good situations, like you see in Seattle, the coach and the GM need to get along. That doesn't happen everywhere. Because, you know, egos are involved. In this situation in Seattle, egos aren't involved. Pete Carroll is easygoing. He's uh, one that is accommodating with everybody. And John Snyder shows no ego. It's like it's like the line that he uses is, ego is your enemy. And so you want to stay away from that ego. And they work so well together. And what's nice now with the deals that are there, they're going to be together at least three more years. And if they can have the success that they hope, they're going to be pinned as one of the best pairs in NFL history. I mean, very much like Ron Wolf and Mike Holmgren. You know, that worked so well for so many years. And the great success they had with Brett Favre and Reggie White and the Green Bay Packers. You know, uh, I've still seen situations where I know calling a coach that didn't like the GM or calling the GM that didn't like the coach, you know, they would talk behind each other's back so bad. And of course, you're kind of caught in the middle. Obviously, that doesn't happen here. And it usually doesn't happen in the places that sustain success. Because again, you want to try to get along with everybody. And that's what's so good about the situation in Seattle. And now what you see is that, uh, you know, here's a system where the general manager and the coach have been to the playoffs five of six years. They've got a team right now that, at least according to ESPN.com, is rated as the best team in the league for the next three years. And they've got every starter that is signed. They still need to do something with Stephen Hauschka, the uh, kicker. You know, and they can they have time to do that either during the season or maybe even after the season. They've got $8.4 million of cap room that's still available. So uh, it's all set up for a little bit of a longer run, and we'll see how that goes. And then after the three years, Pete Carroll has to decide, hey, so want to coach or not want to coach? I mean, it's no pressure on him to do it either way, but he can have fun for the next three years seeing what he can get out of this team. And if he does leave, then it's going to be John Snyder's job to try to you know take that next step and start to replace some of the top players from this run. So general managers are the topic. And coming up, we talk to one of the best, Ron Wolf, formerly of the Green Bay Packers, Oakland Raiders, and other places, just trying to get schooled here with the professor. The theme is the job of an NFL general manager, and of course, uh, no better one to talk about that than Hall of Famer Ron Wolf, who had been in Tampa Bay, he'd been in Oakland, he'd been in Green Bay, and of course, uh, was so happy when to be in the room when we voted, and of course, had you as a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame as a contributor, and of course, then eventually getting in there. And Ron, thanks for joining us. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, John. You know, it's it's interesting because, uh, you know, you now have so many disciples. In fact, I was looking back at the playoffs and, you know, you had at least four disciples of your system that uh, were in there. Of course, John Snyder here in the Seattle area, you know, John Dorsey having Kansas City, you know, Scott McLuhan over with the Washington Redskins, you know, Ted Thompson, of course, uh, in Green Bay. What, as a general manager, did you do to teach a lot of these guys, you know, the system and how to run a franchise? Well, I tell you what, I was I was very fortunate to have uh, have those those guys with me, and I'll tell you, everyone is is different, uh, but they all have one common trait: they love the game of football, and they are dedicated to the game of football. And they enjoy what they do tremendously, uh, and and that's the thing I think that that helps them so much. It's every day. It's it's not like going to work. It's it's like bettering yourself, and and they have such a such a good time. I think now I you know I've been away from these guys for 16 years, so uh, but but I really enjoy watching their success. Each one's different. But but basically, 
they're all the same because of their enthusiasm, their professionalism, and their thoroughness. You know, and the fifth one is Reggie McKenzie, who everybody tells me the Raiders have uh, have done an outstanding job the last three years in drafting and rebuilding that team. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. Is there a, a, a system that you teach them so that they can take that energy, focus it, and then come out and find players? I think so. I think, John, I think the, the big thing is you can either do it or you can't do it. There's no middle of the road here. That's that's the great part of working in professional football and being being part of this great game is the fact that it's cut and dried. You either can evaluate or you can't evaluate. And there's no middle road there. So these guys have uh, have done a phenomenal job with it. Uh, obviously because look at you know, look at the job Ted Thompson has done in Green Bay and John uh, uh, John Snyder in Seattle. Uh, you know, uh, Scott is new in Washington, but in his uh, first or second, I think his second year, he's got them in the playoffs. And John Dorsey has turned around Kansas City. So I think it reflects greatly on, on their capability and their ability. But, but once you have that drive, once you have that di- desire to excel, and they're all bright guys as well. They love and respect the people that came before them. Tremendous re- regard for those guys that play the game and for the people who played the game before them and set the standards. So uh, it's nice to see that they're carrying that on. They got a thorough uh, course from me when uh, we would sit in there and prepare for the draft. We would look at some old time players just in case. Just so they could know who, you know, who Charlie Trippy might be, or Doc Blanchard, or Glenn Davis. So, I mean, they got that. You know, we look at all Cleveland Browns teams, uh, Otto Graham and Marion Motley, and that crowd. So, that yeah, kind of helped. That kind of helped. It, I think. What was the uniqueness of John Snyder? I think the uniqueness of John is that he's not afraid uh, to make a deal. He's not afraid to make change. He's not afraid, uh, uh, and, and to me, that's an important characteristic in this business. He cannot be afraid. Uh, he, he went out and he tried to get a quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. I think he tried three or four times to get a quarterback, and but he never stopped trying, and eventually he got the guy. So that, that, to me, that's a great his great trait. Plus, again, now you, he's smart. He's dedicated. He's... Uh, Tremendous family man. Uh, I have high regard for what he's been able to do. You know, kind of like in your own history, I mean, you were never afraid and were willing to take a move, moves. And, of course, I guess you know one of the biggest, if not the biggest move, was trading for Brett Favre and you know trading with your buddy Ken Herrock uh, and taking him. Talk about the memories of that, because I'm sure there's so many stories into that trade. Well, the big thing was that uh, the I came uh, to Green Bay in uh, in late November of 1991, and so happened the first game that the Packers were playing was in Atlanta. And, uh, when I got here, it was in Atlanta against against the Falcons, obviously. And I was sitting up in the press box, and Ken came up to me and told me, "I'll never forget these words. If you want to see Brett Favre throw." You got to look at him now because once the team comes out, he won't be allowed to do that. So I immediately put down my hot dog and uh, started to go down down the field, and I never got there. But I knew right then and there that I had a chance to get the player that I thought was the best player in the 1991 draft, and worked on it, and worked on it, and worked on it, and finally. It came to fruition. We were able to get him for a number one draft choice. And boy, did that ever work out? I re- I can recall when I, uh, people have asked me what I th- why I made the trade. I made the trade because I thought he'd become a Hall of Fame quarterback. But you know what, John? He was better than that. 
Oh, no question. And am, am I right in remembering that uh, when he got there, he had a little bit of a hip injury that uh, you know caused the doctor some concerns? And of course, I mean, that wasn't going to change the equation. He was going to be on the Packers. No question. No question about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had a, a really interesting uh, uh, medical setup uh, here when I first got here. And, and after, uh, after that thing with Brett, uh, I got that fixed. So, uh, what, what happened was it was a misdiagnosis, which always happens. And, uh, the, the orthopedic man was, was in Green Bay with Dr. McKenzie, who is still the orthopedic man with the Packers, didn't examine him. Somebody else did. And then he told me the story. And then, so then what had happened was this one guy failed him and, we went down and we changed that. And you know what? He never missed a game. So that's the amazing thing. And he of course, it's going to be physically. Yeah, and it's going to be so special for you because I mean, you get to go to Canton where you know you wore the yellow jacket. You get to see Brett Favre. You get to see uh, the the long awaited uh, inductee induction of Ken Stabler, who you you know from the Raiders. I mean, this is going to be a, a great trip for you. No question about that. I'll never forget going through the uh, the draft with Ken Staper when I was with the Raiders because this was a time when when all the experts came out and said a left handed quarterback could never play in a national football league. Don't don't waste a pick. And uh so we had on our staff, uh interestingly, John, we had four uh five coaches at that time. John Madden had been added uh as a linebacker coach. But John Roush was the offensive backfield coach, a legend in SEC football, had a lot of contacts down there. And he was the one that kind of convinced how I think that, that we should go ahead and do this. I mean, I was beating on the table. It was He was my guy all the way, and uh, Kenny Stabler. And uh, I think that once John said that, we do everything. The problem is that none of us are left-handed, and we don't know how to coach a left-handed quarterback. And I think just that thing right there turned that around. But the person that turned Kenny Stabler around was John Madden when he became head football coach. And what what did John do to turn him around? Well, he just took advantage of his tremendous uh, his tremendous ability. He let let him be Ken Stabler and. I mean, never practices, John, that the ball never touched the ground. That's how accurate he was. And it's unfortunate that by the time he got got to uh, the Raiders, uh, he, he had no longer had his running ability that he had in college due to a knee injury in college. But what a, what a great career he had. How about that five consecutive uh, seasons he took his team to the championship game. Remarkable. That's only been measured in, in this new football now by one other guy. I think Brady did that mm-hmm. five consecutive years, taking his uh, team to the championship game. That's a rare feat. You know, aside for the trade and getting uh, Brett Favre to Green Bay, I mean, you historic in football history did one of the greatest things, and being able to get Reggie White in free agency to come to Green Bay, you know, change the whole equation because now here's Reggie White, one of the greatest players in football history, coming into this small town of Green Bay, and it just livened everything up and really gave such a great run for you and Mike Holmgren. How did that all happen? Well, it happened because uh, uh, it's interesting you ask that question. We uh, The Packers just had their Hall of Fame banquet this past weekend. And Jimmy Sexton, who was Reggie White's agent, happened to be there. And he was telling me that he he vividly recalls me telling Reggie that he was already a great football player, but he comes to Green Bay, he'll become a legend. And that happened. And I think what happened was tremendous job by Ray Rose to recruit uh, Reggie White. Uh, Mike Reinfeldt was working through Sexton to get the, the money right. And more importantly, when Reggie came here, he was treated 
just like a normal human being. He got picked up in a uh, an SUV, not a you know not a limousine. He went to eat at Red Red Lobster, and they promised him that if he comes, they would fillet the fish for the catfish for him. And those those types of things, people laugh at those things, but you know that's Green Bay, and that's that's what it's all about. This is a walking history book here. Every time you come around in the city of Green Bay, you bump into the history of the National Football League. And uh, whatever it was, it worked out, and he came, and we had a lot of success. And I'll say this. In, 19, in 1991, when I took the job, a lot of people told me that I was crazy to come up to Green Bay because you could never succeed there. Well, once we signed Reggie White and the advent of free agency, as you, as you acknowledged, in 1993, from that point on till I, I left, we had the best record in the National Football League, which was not supposed to happen, uh, according to all the, uh, the court experts. Uh, and uh, Favre played, obviously, Mike Longren, Brett Favre. We had uh, Reggie White. We had a pretty solid football team and did some really good things up here. And it may change the image from the worst record in football when I got here to the best record in football when I left. But even more important, I mean, it created the legacy of the Packers and the Packer fans. You know, here's this, uh, you know, I guess you can't call it just a small town because basically it's a small state, but the state is so in love with this franchise. And, you know, you set everything back on the right course that's now continued. I mean, uh, the success after you left and all these different things, what Ted Thompson's doing. And, of course, it means so much because it's such great history that, you know, you can be small in area but big in stature. No question about that. It's a, it's a great story. It's a, it's a wonderful place to work. It's a, a great place to play. It's a tr- tremendous atmosphere here. And we, when I came in here, we, tr- we tried to take advantage of that. You know, play up to the, the great players under Lombardi and, and the guys under Lambeau and people like that. So you can do that here because – because of the the tradition and the history, it's a it's a wonderful place. And we, the fact that you know Ted and and Mike McCarthy have kept this thing going here, is uh, a great tribute to what they've done, and and really and truly to Green Bay Packers fans and Packers football. I was reading the other day because it's one thing you have to do. I live here in the summertime in Green Bay. Run to the light, run to daylight. The Lombardi book, mm-hmm. and they won't let you in here unless you, uh, <laughs> unless you read that when you come back into town. But they talk about in there that in, in school the kids are taught the Star Strangled Banner and the Packers fight song. And then <laughs> I never know, knew there was one, but that's interesting. <laughs> well, I wouldn't the, doubt that. And, of course, I mean, you helped set that up. And also setting up the fact that uh, a lot of the people that you taught are doing similar things in their cities, whether it's uh, John Snyder in Seattle, whether it's John Dorsey in Kansas City, what's going on in Washington, and now the resurgence of the Raiders. Hey, Ron, thank you so much. And uh, tell you what, I mean, it was so much of an honor to be involved in uh, you getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But you got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame because you deserved it. Well, I appreciate that, and I appreciate it. all the help. All the people like this, the guys you just mentioned, people like this are the reason I got in the Hall of Fame. And uh, what a wonderful honor that is! And thank you so much. Good news, everyone. <laughs> It's time to Ask the Professor. I'm the Professor. Each week on Schooled with the Professor, we take the chance to take your question. And, of course, uh, Clayton Schooled is our hashtag. And, of course, we get this from Strict Nine. And Strict Nine's question is of Ted Thompson, John Snyder, John Dorsey, uh, Scott McLuhan, Reggie McKenzie, who's out in Oakland. Who sticks to Wolf's principles most and who sticks to them least? Well, 
honestly, when you really look at the equation, I think the two that stick to it the most would be John Snyder and uh, Scott McLuhan. And the reason that I, I use that and you were able to hear what Ron Wolf says, sometimes you just got to be fearless. I mean, you got to take some chances. You've got to be bold. And you can see John Snyder's being bold. I mean, he made the trade for Percy Harvin. It didn't work out. And of course, as time went on, he was able to, you know, maneuver, make, get rid of Percy Harvin in a trade, yet free up money to re-sign and extend contracts of two core group players. And you look at Scott McLuhan, you know, he had done such an unbelievable job when he was in San Francisco being bold, coming back and making, you know, decisions on Navarro Bowman and taking the the guys like a uh, Patrick Willis and, you know, getting big players. I mean, you, you, you have to be defined if you're going to be a bold mover. And for example, the one big philosophy, big philosophy that McLuhan has big, he wants big defensive players. He wants big offensive linemen. You know, he stresses that. In fact, I think in back of his office, he has a big chart that has all these big offensive linemen, pictures of big players. And so he has that. And you know John Snyder? You know, he's willing to make the bold move with uh, the trade, say, for Jimmy Graham. You know, try to push to get a Russell Wilson. You know, all these guys are good. You know, clearly, I know that uh, because Ron was involved in getting Reggie McKenzie the job with the Oakland Raiders, you figure that Reggie does, you know, follow those same disciplines. I mean, they all follow the same disciplines because they are ones that they learn from the best and they're trying to be the best. And in the case of Reggie McKenzie, he takes over a Raider team that just didn't have much talent. Not many guys had worked out. And of course, that first year, he didn't even have a draft choice until the third round. So he goes into this and, you know, he takes a couple of shots on some guys. Then he starts seeing, okay, wait a second. Second round, here's a Derek Carr. Bold move in the first round. Khalil Mack, I mean, you didn't know the way he played at the University of Buffalo. Was he a linebacker? Was he a defensive end? But he was a great athlete who could play. And he thought, Reggie, that you would take him with the idea that maybe he can be like an Alden Smith or a Vaughn Miller. Well, as it turns out, I mean, he's Khalil Khalil Mack's one of the best defensive players in the league. Bold. I guess you could say the one that sticks to it the least, although he's so successful and all these guys are successful, would be Ted Thompson because Ted is a little bit more cautious. Ted, I mean, again, great success. And remember, here's the guy who took Aaron Rodgers at a time that they had Brett Favre. Now, that's bold, but, of course, the caution comes in that, you know, Ted Thompson disdains from really getting involved in free agency. He has the belief that uh, you go ahead, get all the players out of the draft, you get homegrown talent. And clearly it's worked. Look at all the success the Packers have had. And, uh, you know, only on rare, rare occasions will they dabble in free agency. Yeah, they were able to get a Julius Peppers. But for the most part, and I know Ted, you know, takes a lot of criticism for not being more involved in free agency. But why? His formula, learned from Ron Wolf, works. But he probably doesn't use the same bold technique. Because, you know, if you're Ron Wolf, I mean, you see... You see Brett Favre, you get Brett Favre. You see Reggie White, you get Reggie White. And you you don't worry about precedent. You don't worry about anything else. I mean, you're trying to get greatness. And like a Ron Wolf looked at the talent of a Brett Favre and thought, hey, there's a guy who could be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You know, ironically, he's going in this year. You look at Reggie White, it's like, this guy is already playing at a Hall of Fame level. Let's go get him. You know, bold moves. And so when you're trying to learn from guys like that, uh, you can do it. I mean, even John Dorsey, you look what he did in Kansas City last year. And you know this from the local area is that, you know, Marcus Peters had some difficulties at the University of Washington, but he was a phenomenal cornerback, you know, a great shutdown type of cornerback. Well, first round pick, Marcus Peters goes with John Dorsey to the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. And Peters was clearly the one of the best rookies last year. I mean, he did everything that everybody thought he could do from coverage, and he wasn't a problem on the team. I mean, it was a bold move, even though, you know, with some of the incidents he had and being kicked off uh, the Huskies, you thought maybe that uh, he would go second round. No, he went first and probably should have gone higher. I mean, he was clearly one of the best rookies. So when you're talking about, uh, you know, following a disciple like Ron Wolf, I mean, you, all five of these guys have followed the pattern. You know, the least maybe Ted Thompson, but let's put it this way. They're all in the playoffs, and the, the Raiders will be next. Uh, going into the playoffs, five disciples, five potential playoff teams. And of course, they learn from the best Ron Wolf. And that was our subject this week. It's the general manager.